Let's do Nims milling one. And so you've got a handful of questions in several different categories. So I just want to skip through a couple of these things. If you haven't done this on your own, you should go through these questions. If you don't get an 80% or higher on this, you're probably going to have a problem as you go to the test. When you take the test at the testing center Tuesday morning, um, you can go on down there. Remember, you need your machinery handbook. You can have, you don't have to have these things. Machinery handbook, um, a piece of paper, a writing utensil, um, uh, a calculator, it can't be a phone calculator, um, and a photo ID. Try to eliminate, I've never had a group that didn't have to come back at least one person and get something. So never ever sent a group down there and everybody tested and everybody came back. Somebody always comes back and is like, I forgot my ID. I didn't, I didn't bring my handbook or whatever, something. So try to be those people. Um, so you get 90 minutes to take the test and that will not finish out the cert. Um, this, what finishes out the cert is the test and the part. So I need the part in time to take, to send it out to get checked. I will check it. I will send it out to get checked and then we will, we will confirm it after that. If those things don't happen, just taking the test does not get the certification for it. Okay. So I don't want you to be like, oh, October 17th is the last day. Got my test done. Didn't get my part done. But I'm good. Because you're not good. You got to get that part done. And I've got to have enough time to get it checked. Okay. Surface finishes are measured in what? Micro inches. Yep. What do you check a surface finish with? Not D. That's good. No, what it's not. What? Comparison chart. Comparison chart. You just used one yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got all the yeah, all the different surface finishes on there. So a toolmaker's microscope or an eye loop may help to do those things, but really your best answer on here is the comparison chart. All right. Um, the depth of a three eighths diameter counterbore is best measured with a what? Depth micrometer. Yeah. What is the depth of a 3 8 diameter counterbore? If the bolts did, let's just say we're doing a counterbore for a 3 8 socket head cap screw, um, 3 8 16, what's the depth of the counterbore? You might know off the top of your head, 3 8 of an inch. It's always the diameter of the, of the bolt. So if it's a half inch socket head cap screw, the head depth, half inch. Always. Um, let's just randomly grab ones. Okay, eight. The dimension of a hole is stated as nine sixteenths plus or minus the sixty fourth of an inch. Which of the following statement statements is true if a five eighty four diameter pin slips into the hole. So what is nine sixteenths? In a prior, or in a decimal. I can wait. Point five six two five. Five six two five. Okay. What's the high side of the tolerance? So add a 64th of an inch to it, and then subtract a 64th of an inch to it. What's the high side? Five. Seven, eight, one. Point five, seven, eight, one. What's the low? Uh, 
562.5 and subtract a 64 from it. What's a 64? Subtract that from 562. 5469. 5469. That was that was difficult. Yeah, I was trying to like remember the fraction, the decimal of 164 to subtract it from the back. Because I can't just subtract the fraction, I can't subtract it. One divided by 64. Yeah, and then I have to remember that number and then go back to 565. Subtract it. Memory store. Yeah, and I would get slipped every single time. And then when I looked at the 5625, two five, that did it. <laughs> I was gone. I was like, dude, we're not going to make it through. We're, we're definitely not making it through this test. Okay, so what is true if a 584 pin goes through there? It's oversized. The hole is oversized. Fair. Yep. Hole is definitely oversized. Um, which of the following describes the safest procedure for measuring a part on the milling machine? Raise the table and check the dimension. Stop the machine, deburr, brush chips clear, check the dimension, raise the tool, check the dimension, deburr, blow chips off the table, take the part out of the machine, deburr, brush chips. Uh, and stop the machine. Well, that was an e, odd, that's an odd order right e there. It starts with stopping the machine, which is probably. Right, right, things. yeah, like that one. <laughs> like you're, you're gonna take the part out and then stop the machine. So yeah, stop the machine, deburr, brush tips clear, check the dimension. I think that that, I think that's what you would do even without thinking about the steps. It's more reasonable than the other one. Exactly. You know, and, and again, they're looking for the best answer, right? They're definitely, if there is an answer that says um, after it's passed, after it's fly cutting, that you just slip your micrometer on the end while it's fly cutting, that's definitely not the answer. So um, I've, I've seen that. I have seen literally a guy try to check a part on the lathe with the micrometer while the lathe was spinning. And he was like, I'm just gonna gently wrench down on it and just like, like not snug it, but, um, and what do you think it did? Yeah, just slung it right out of his hand. And luckily it didn't go. Gone. Yeah. Luckily, I, and I, I'm telling you, this is an, only by an act of God that generally it goes either up or shoots down into the pan. Because, like, it can go, that's, it could be easily straight up face shot, right? Hardly ever does it, which is miraculous, man. Um, this same guy, um, and I've seen this happen more than once, was running a lathe and had a part sticking out the headstock, like the stock was too long. But it was really long. And so, one inch, no, um, inch and a half stock. And he had a section of it in the spindle and cranked it up real fast. And the material got some centrifugal force and it, it bent, it picked the lathe up and it, it kickstanded it forward at him. And he shot back out of the way and it poof, right down on the ground in front of him. And I'm like, bro, you should never be able to run a machine. Um, no. Now, the shop that I worked at when I very first started, it was really, it was nuts because we only had half a building and most of the rooms looked like this and we had shoved CNC machines in these rooms and we're running like crazy. It was so bad that the sheriff would walk through every morning and just serve, you know, papers to people. And like they would, people would be running and they would, he'd be like, oh, Billy, hand it to him, and then just take him. And we were like, Billy's not going to work today now, I guess. And so um, at that time, I was the delivery driver. I mean, I was just, I was tw 20 years old. Like, 
you were finding crack pipes and stuff there every day. It was like insane. It was nuts, man. And um, so one day I'm walking through one of the hallways. We had these really narrow hallways and stuff. And um, and so they were kind of doing the same thing and on the CNC lathe. And they had um, the back end of it open, similar to what that ST is. We have the back of it open out there in the, on the CNC machine. And the back of it was open, and they had a piece of brass, like um, three-quarter brass, sticking out the back about this far. Ha we did it all the time. It happened all the time. And so, you know, we would just, like, there's a guard that goes over there, so we'd hang the guard out in front of it so it wouldn't, the people would know that you had material hanging out. Once you ran one or two parts, then it was in there. You put the guard back on it, and everything was good. Guy starts the machine up. He must have had his clamp pressure not as tight. And so he's, he's running it, and he sees his material disappear. And so he's, like, setting up, and so he's got a spindle running. I mean, those things ran about 30,000 RPM. And so he's coming down there, and, and he's, he sees the material just sort of, like, gone. And so this, no kidding, the brass, this piece of brass did that same thing. It pulled it, and it bent it, and it broke it, and it shot out the roof. It shot out the freaking ceiling. And, like, it sounded like a freaking bomb going off. And, like, people are walking right by there, man. And, like, like within as far as I am from the table. And, I mean, everybody just hits the ground. And we're like, what was that? And uh, he's like, my material's gone. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what happened. And so he goes back there. And, I mean, you can see it's broken off and just hanging there. And he's like... And there's a ceiling tile. And there is a, a shape of that thing shot right through there. And he's like, oh, my gosh. I was like, what just happened, man? And, I was, I, and he was like, don't say anything. And I was like, I'm pretty sure everybody knows. <laughs> Plenty of stuff happened like that. All right. Um, included angle on the point. do is a so, I've seen it all. oh yeah, I mean, we literally did see it all. We really did. I mean, we saw just the craziest things happen. Um, <clears throat> as a boss in something like that, you, you back off because clearly you are either allowing people to do things they're not trained on or you're pushing them too hard to do some things. And you need to, you need to do some adjustments because either that guy was in such a rush that he missed a step of increasing his chuck pressure because um, on a lathe like that, they're hydraulic chucks, and you, everything, chuck pressure controls everything. Chuck pressure controls size, diameter, all those things, ever, all, the, all the pieces of it. And so he got in a hurry. He was trying to get the parts grow, going. So soon after that, we moved to having set up guys rather than having the operator set up the machine. We toggled back and forth throughout the years of which whatever we had, whatever we could make work at the time. Um, we had like 30 guys, we had like, I don't know, like 30 guys on three shifts um, running about a dozen CNC machines, and sometimes they were running two and three, which was very common. And sometimes they were sawing their own stuff, doing their own, I mean, they were like, junk, they were just running around the shop all the time trying to keep these things going, early days of the shop. <clears throat> if that were to happen to me today, I would back off, <clears throat> develop some kind of procedure to make sure that you had like the steps in place to, to like chuck, check truck pressure before you move on to the next thing. Don't, don't allow parts to stick out the back of the chuck, you know, those kinds of things. You got to put some safeguards in place. It's, it's one thing to do something that's not super safe at home by yourself, you know, when that, that's all on you. When you, people are working for you or other people are around you, like it got exponentially more dangerous, you know, because I mean, somebody could have been walking by, it could have slung out to them and hit them, yeah, it would have got you. Would have killed somebody. Could it? Could have killed somebody. Yeah, like that's where you got to start to think. This is more than just me and my stupid decisions. Because like everybody's done something at home that they were like pretty sketchy. You know, that's all on you. You know, when it affects somebody else, that's when it becomes a huge problem. I would say don't do stupid, unsafe things at home too. But it's really a factor when it becomes somebody else. So 
I would, if that were me now today, I'd be like, <clears throat> we will develop a, a new check system, safety setup procedure so that that doesn't happen again. There's always variables. There's always outlying things that can come up. So you just, you, you just got to be watchful, mindful of those things. All right, including the angle for the, and the point of a general purpose drill is what? 118. <coughs> 118, yep. Great. Um, let's go 15. Uh, which of the following is most common drill of practice? Drilling practice. Drilling holes, right? Because you need, you need to drill for every one of those. Yeah. Got to have the drill. You don't have to have all those other things, but you got to have the drill. Which metal removal variable has the greatest effect on tool life? Depth of cut, surface feet per minute, or cutting speed, feed rate, or lubrication? Gosh, I don't know. That is a really tough one. Right. I can see if you rub too much and you... Uh, yeah. If you take it too deep, you can straight break the tool, but you spin the other angle. Well, if you break the tool, that definitely affects tool life, right? I mean, it's no longer... It's dead after that. Um, so, taking too big of a cut, or... All of those are just bad. That's just it. I All feel like... Bad. All of those definitely play a factor. Hang tight. I printed out the answers. I want to see where their answer is. Inch deep cut. Let's go. out there again. They're never going to see these. These door people can't even get these doors right. <clears throat> it says B. So, yeah. um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, so, if you go too slow, like, I don't think that that has a, as big of an adverse effect on, you know, some of those other things. You can dull a tool out. You can dull a tool out pretty fast by going slow, but that's not primarily what you have. I mean, normally a tool is breaking because I've got too fast of a feed rate, too heavy of a depth of cut. I guess, I guess, on some of those things, that could be also could go the other way. Too light of a cut doesn't really affect like, it. I told you the tip of a needle at one point just because I was taking too light of a cut for just rubbing. I guess I'll be too slow and put it in the floor and go in. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it can definitely just wear it to death, too. So, all right, so they're saying cutting speed. Correct RPM for a three quarter diameter high speed steel end mill. Machining 01 at 50 surface feet per minute. My RPM. What what are you calculating? And why are you not calculating? I can't remember what, what equation this is. Okay. Yeah, you should be doing an equation. And so um, All right, <clears throat> where would you find a resource like that? Machinery yeah, Machinery Handbook. Um, at this point, you can look at lots of different resources because you're not in the test right now. So you could look at um, the CNC uh, book. You could look at um, your, is it B? Why do you think it's B? How did you calculate to B? Fifty, which is your service feet per minute. Did you do times four? Which is the 
constant ish, um, and then divided by what? Diameter. Diameter. Um, sorry, I didn't do it right. Um, the diameter is what, three quarter? Is that right? Which is the diameter. And you got, what'd you get? What was your actual number? Uh, 266 and then just six repeating. Okay. So, service fee per minute times the constant, which is really 3.82. Yeah, that Yeah. But four is like the quick number, right? Four is just the faster one to do, divided by the diameter. This works for turning or milling. So to figure up your RPM for your spindle, you take the diameter of the stock or the hole that you're working on. So it's if you're on the outside, but that's exactly right. And so now, um, how do you figure feed rate then? Let's say I want to go, I got a um, LPM, RPM, number of teeth. How many times in a teeth time? Is it in? Chip load, yep. So RPM, that means you have to find one always before you find the other. Number of flutes, four flutes, two flutes, whatever, chip load, 5,000, 3,000, whatever it's asking you for. Okay, good. Feed rates for the milling operations are expressed as inches per minute. CNC milling machine uses feed rate, a feed rate given in inches per revolution. What is the feed in inches per revolution for a four flute and mill with a recommended chip load of, um, chip load per tooth of 14 inches? <clears throat> so here's my problem with that question. <clears throat> CNC milling machine is not asking you for feed per revolution inches per revolution. It's asking for, that would be inches per revolution or feed per revolution has more to do with the lathe than it does for the mill, right? Like so, and when I'm doing inches per revolution um, on the lathe, every time I, my revolution is one on the spindle, I'm, I advance 12,000, 6,000, 14,000, whatever my customer is. So that's just multiplying point or Yeah, so. So you just know in a revolution, um, you're going, um, yeah, you're just doing a just quick multiplication on that. But that's, that's one of those questions that I feel like isn't really, it's just not really a good question for that. Proper dispos disposal of oily rags and wipes prevents fires by preventing what? would say C as well. I'm going to double check that. Um, so I used to work <clears throat> yeah, C. I used to work at a sh shop that made wood work, not woodworking products, but they made wood products as a wood shop. <clears throat> and I was in the staining department, which was terrible. And uh, I was like 16, got this job, it's the worst job in the world. And um, so we had this big paint room, paint and stain room, and they took all the oily rags and they just put them all up on a pile. And over the weekend, one time, they just built up heat, burned the building down. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm at 16, I had no clue what that meant, you know? And I was, all I could think of was, did I do that? And I didn't do that, but um, oh, it was terrible. If solid material becomes lodged in the eye, the first step for proper sur first aid is to definitely A. Definitely A. What do you say? 
Let's see. Pull the top eyelid over the bottom lid. Um, yeah, rub the eye in a circular motion. I have heard rub your eye towards your nose. Um, close the eyelid and rub from left to right to dislodge the material. One thing we don't have over in this building that we had before was the eye wash station. Yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, I'm not sure why that was not a thing. Uh, maybe it's just not a requirement. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but of course, whenever I started here at the other shop, we didn't even have fire extinguishers in the shop. I mean, I walked to the shop like the first day I started, I was like, where's the fire extinguishers? And they were like, well, that's a great question. And I'm like, I feel like there should be some here. We're going to need those for sure. <laughs> yeah, we never did. Um, but, whew, man, Better definitely. Huh? Better to have them than not. Better to have them than not, yeah. Right, yeah, and 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 to go. So why did the building burn down? Did you guys use a fire extinguisher? Well, we don't have them. That would be a hard sell. You know what I mean? I mean, because some, somebody's going to go. Really? <laughs> yeah, I think you'd still be able to find them. All right, tap drill for a three sixteen internal thread, which makes sense. That should go without saying is blank inches in diameter and provides a blank thread engagement. Which one is true? You're probably going to need your handbook for this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Better go grab it. Go grab your handbook. Um, let's see. I think, oh, I've got one right there. Yep, you got it. All three of you grab handbooks. I'm pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's, it's CC5. Wow. Oh, this one's trash compared to my last one. I don't know how you figure out thread engagement, but I don't know. I think it might be a I'm just taking a guess. It's either B or C. I can't remember the well, I'm just looking at the one that's right there. Which is Yeah. That's Five nine five is what we're looking at. Those four are three five still. That's that's one A. It doesn't specify what it is. Oh wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's B. I think it's B. So I'm just gonna three five. That's one A. I remember like directly looking at the system before, but I yeah. had a bad mistake and I just didn't look at it.
They get, I get, I get an hour with you guys, or an hour and a half the other day with you guys, so I'll give them the same amount. What'd you get? Find it? You just were like hoping that some chart would just jump out, weren't you? Because that's what, I had my 101s in here the other day, and they would like flip pages, and I'm like, are you going somewhere with this thing? And they were like, I don't really know what to do. I feel like I've seen it here before where it just yeah. like, says in the table. It does. Yeah, so index. Um, I think I'd be looking at tab drill. Add on pages. Right. Yeah. Signs yeah. So let's see, we're at. That's the closest percentage point. But the number is kind of off. 278 or 2078. If you look at 3816, it's under capping and drug testing. Minor diameter. Right. So, uh, so 257 F drill is the tap drill for 516s. So, normally for a 3 8 you're looking at a 516 drill. That's your, like when you guys tap it, if you say, hey, I need a tap drill for a 3 8 16. 516 drill is what I would give you. That gives you what? It's not 75, but it gives you what? 77. 77. Pretty close. And so again, we're looking for best fit. Okay, so our best answer, not necessarily the perfect answer. Okay. So did everybody find it? Everybody at 2077? That so if you cannot bring a sheet of notes with you. But if you, I, I think you could, I, I assume you could probably dog ear a page. I don't know that for sure. Um, generally, if students bring in post-its with, with information on them inside the pages that don't stick out, usually that seems to be okay. So, so they've never said, I've, I've actually seen her see that in it with other people's stuff where it might just say um, thread information on page 2078. Oh, okay. No, because they're not going to ask you this question. Yeah, I know. Yes, sir. Darren, I get a 3-8 scholarship whenever you have time. Yes. Yep. And one of my toolbox. On the toolbox? Okay. So if you need just some quick reference or, and I really, since, and I think that they probably give us some latitude because these are not your books. And so if you highlight in these books, these are our books, not your books. So instead of highlighting, you can say um, sign, sign information is on page 3000, whatever, wherever it might happen to be. So it's just kind of a quick reference so that you can find some of those things faster. Those things seem to be okay. For you to put lists of answers in there is going to be, it, it won't be beneficial to you because they're not going to ask you these same questions. So if you're like, Question 21C, 
you're going to get there and go, not the same question 21. And so you're just going to be like, ah, no good. Is that like the NIMS test where it'll be easier than the practice test? They're supposed to be. I mean, we build practice tests so that they are, like, challenging. Now, my biggest complaint on the practice test, or that when people come back from the NIMS test, they're like, those weren't the exact same questions. And I'm like, we never said they were the exact same. They're the same type of questions, right? Like, so, so you'll go down there, and it's going to ask you about a half 13. So what, what, what's the tap drill for a half 13? Some of these things should be coming memory for you, right? Like you should be starting to memorize these things. You should still be able to find it on that 20, yeah, 2078 page. 13. So you can do a 7 16 but it's only going to get you 62,000 threat engagement. If we're trying to stay at that 75, then 2764s. Yep, 2764 should be your tap drill size for a half 13. I've had some fun in that going to the calculator and doing a half inch drill. Sure, machinery calc or the uh, machines calculator. Absolutely, these things are the best. Um, these are like if you want to cheat, this is your cheating tool. And it's not really cheating because it's just finding the information. These things are flat out spectacular. Like I used to suck at triangles and this, like you can figure out the angle, length, whatever, whichever leg you want in like two seconds, man. So these are the best. All right. The type of tap that is best suited for finishing Finish tapping a blind hole is what? Yeah. Um, so we've switched a lot of our taps around. Um, we used to do a tapered tap or a plug tap for about everything. And then when we wanted to go to the bottom of a hole, we just grind the end of it off. Plug tap works pretty good for that. We try to stay away from four flute taps because they typically cause problems in holes. A four flute tap is a great hand tap not a good machine tap. Well, honestly, when you're trying to machine tap, you're looking for really less flutes, not more flutes. Um, and so a bottoming tap allows you to have threads all but like the last thread and a half at the bottom. Um, so pretty good. And so one of the other things that we've switched to is we're doing a lot of spiral flute taps so that they're pulling the chip back up, even if they're just a normal through hole, rather than pushing the chip down um, so uh, that way we can take care of um, getting those chips out of there. But we have to kind of make some decisions about um, what, what taps to use and what's the best things to use. Milling operation in these. Which of the following types of end mills is capable of plunge cutting a hole? E, four fluted center cutting. <laughs> that on, are you talking about B? I don't think so. Because even though it, the two fluted end mill is normally bottom cutting, um, it doesn't say that it's bottom cutting. Because I've got two fluid end mills that have like that, that center in it where they're ground. Um, so unless it says it's a bottom cutting end mill, I wouldn't assume that it is. Yeah, if it doesn't say center cutting, um, then I would. The answer sheet does say it's E, right? No. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. I, and yes. Real quick. Can I get this? Is it three eighths? It's supposed to, it's supposed to be three eighths. You better it. It's like three eighty. Which is not three eighths. It's like three eighty-seven. Yeah, that's a little all. over. Yeah, you can't use twelve thousand. Yeah, twelve thousandths over. So shouldn't the three drop? I think that'll work for me. Once you get it down to the right. 
side. Put it in a five jaw check. Five jaw? No. <laughs> there is a six jaw check. We don't have six jaw check. Do four jaw though? I would. So there, the only hiccup in the four jaw check is is three eighths is almost too small to get those jaws together. Okay. So you might, since it's so big, you might be able to bump up to the next size collet. Because I think our, I think we have collets that, on some of the collets they move in sixty fourths. Some of them are thirty seconds. Some of them are sixty fourths. Then if you go to the next sixty fourth, you would be able to, you'd be there. Mm -hmm. You might be able to squeeze the next bigger collet down. So grab your collet out of that room. Just it's the first yellow cabinet to your left, okay. and and see if you can get another collet to hold it in there. Get yourself down to three eighths. Once you're down to three eighths, that's where you need to be so that you can get it switch back to that. It's going to hold it way better than one of those other collets will. That way, you can get full body connection onto it. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. So let's see what forty five actually says. Oh, forty five says E. I would be fearful of that question. It is a it is a leading question. You know, I mean, people are assuming that the two fluid end mill is bottom cutting or center cutting. I can take one, I can go show you one right now that's not. So, because it has a hole in the center of it, yeah. Oh, an edge finder has a tip diameter of 200 thousandths. What distance must the table move to align to the center of the edge finder if the edge, if it's to find the edge of the workpiece? Yeah. So, you know, in just questions like this, it can say things like using an edge finder, how much should I move over? Well, you don't know. You know, depending on the edge finder. Yeah, it depends on the size of the edge finder. So make sure that you're paying attention to those questions. Um, let's see. Accurately align a vise mounted on the table of a vertical milling machine perpendicular to the column. The vise should be aligned with what? Remember, because your movable jaw can clunk, 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 it can be shifty. It can move. It can move, yeah. I mean, on our vices, most of our vices are pretty tight. And like, so, you know, again, not to, I'm not trying to pick apart questions. If you're using, like, like on, our, on our CNC mills now, we've switched to um, self-centering vices. So both jaws move. So there is no stationary jaw anymore. So both jaws are, the vices go this way, and they just pull together at the same. So... It's pretty neat. What? It's pretty neat. It's super neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you just kind of, kind of have to, kind of have to read into the question and make sure that you're saying, okay, of these answers or of these choices, this is my best choice. To ensure even seating and to combat any tip, tipping action caused by the movable jaw, what is or the best practice is to what? Use gauge pins underneath parallels. Strike the workpiece softly with a dead blow hammer and test the parallels for movement. Use paper shims underneath the parallels and underneath the workpiece. Mount the workpiece on parallels and tighten the vise very tightly with a leverage bar. Easy to say. <laughs> yeah, I've never really heard the term leverage bar before in my life, but yeah, okay, it's, not, it's definitely not D, okay? Uh, it's definitely not A either. I think B. That's what I'm doing. Well, how do you do it? How do you make sure that a workpiece is flat in the vise? Smack it with a hammer. Yeah. Smack it with a hammer. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, almost all of you guys. I could not win an arm wrestling contest with my daughter. So 
I think it's probably softly. It's softer than you think, I bet. Because I've come and loosened things that you guys have tightened. And I'm like, oh, that's adorable. adorable. <laughs> yeah. That's funny that you think that's tight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you, you want to you wanna have the right amount of pressure on it. If it's a big, solid piece, you can just beat it, beat the snot out of it. You're probably more concerned about the hammer disintegrating rather than the workpiece. If it's a thin workpiece, you know, again, if the workpiece is three eighths or thinner and you're beating this thing to death, you're probably bowing it. So use the right amount of pressure for the right thing, right? And so use the right hammer. I mean, if, if I walk back here and, and Chance has got his framing hammer and he's just beating a piece of quarter inch stock trying to get it lay flat in the vise and he's like, Every time I mill it, it's just not flat. I'm going to be like, what is wrong with you using the right things for the right jobs, right? Like, What's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're trying to build a samurai sword or what? <laughs> All right. 54. The x-axis on a vertical mill represents blank. Y-axis on the vertical represents blank. Z-axis represents blank. What? Or it's longitudinal. Yeah, it can't be. Either way, it can't be any one of those on vertical axis. Any, no matter. Okay, so that's really good as far as when you're looking at multiple guest <laughs> style questions. Eliminate those ones that you just know that are not. So I'm assuming the one that's getting you is longitudinal. Yeah. 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 So think about latitude and longitude. Um, lo you know, you got your your latitude. You got your longitude, and so yeah, I I don't I don't know. That's one. So I would say, is my if if I were to write this question, it would be like, is my left and right, is my forward backward? You know, movement like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's my cross feed. It's my longitudinal feed. It's my vertical feed. X, Y, Z. Which of the following is not a function of layout lines? Billions C. Billions D. Yeah. So I think, like, when I read C, I was with you. Uh, it, it's D. I, I would I would say ninety nine percent sure it's D, but but C also it doesn't prevent errors. You know, I mean, visually that's the purpose of it, right? So that you don't do that. But they don't. It doesn't necessarily stop it. So it's not like there's some kind of magical. I can't go past this. So but yeah, D is the answer. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's where don't go. Don't be too quick to answer the question. Make sure you're reading through all the all the selections that you have there. Um, to bore a hole perpendicular to the face of the workpiece, the machine table should be blank to the spindle. Perpendicular. Yeah. As I think through like secondary graph right there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, what type of spindle taper is most commonly found on a Bridgeport milling machine for whole collet? Did you hear, did you hear what he said? What? All right. So the 5C collet, we primarily use the 5C collet for the lathes. Um, that's by far probably the most common place for it or for rotaries on the mill. So those are kind of your, your number one places to see those. Um, where am I going to see B at? A Morris taper? I don't know. I don't remember the others. Morris taper would be headstock, tailstocks of the lathe. Um, how, to, how about a Brown and Sharp or a Jarno? I 
If you can give me that answer, I will give you the same opportunity that I gave my youth class last night. I said, if you can prove me wrong, I will run through Windsor in a women's bikini covered in grape jelly. <laughs> um, and then uh, they said, can we shave your head and put makeup on you? And I was like, yes. Um, so for us, we don't have anything like that. The Brown and Sharp style taper and the Jarno taper, very close to the Morris taper. Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, either one of those. So here's, here's what you got to remember. These two, this company, um, doesn't even make stuff like that anymore. This company is not even in existence anymore. So, um, but there are still these styles of tapers out there. Here's why you see questions like this. All, uh, not all of these, but the Morris, the Jarno, and the Brown and Sharp are pretty similar to each other. If you were to grab an adapter and put it into the tailstock of the head or of the lathe or the headstock, and you can clink clink, and it kind of doesn't seat in right, that should be a red flag. Is this the right taper? For you to come back, correct the taper, make sure that you've got things right, then make it. I've made a a singular singular part in my entire life with the Jarno taper on it. The only reason I even knew what it was is because I did my apprenticeship with a guy. When I was 20, he was about 70. And he's like, what are you making? I was like, some weird taper. He's like, what is it? And I, I was like, I don't know, jar something. And he's like, oh, Jarno. He's like, well, here's your degrees for it. And I was like, thank you, you know? And so anyways, that's literally the only, the only time I ever made it and the only time that I've ever known anybody to know it. And he just knew it off the top of his head. This has some different labeling of the machine here. So you've got the mill. Let's see if we can't squeeze it down just a little bit. Yeah, black and white is a really old. Oh, old picture. Yeah. I don't think that the picture on the NIMS test looks like this, though. So um, let's just do some quick things. What's 11? The knee. Yep, the knee moves up and down. Um, here you've got your, your adjustment handle for it. Here's your, um, your Y axis. What's, what's three? We don't have those handles on ours. Yes, it is for your quilt feed. Quilt feed handle. I would say it's the base. Let's just see. Um, one of those questions probably is the base. Yeah, I would say they're calling that the base of it. All right, anything on there that you see that you don't know the answer to or you don't know what it's called? Is number one. Um, number one, I would say it's probably, I don't know. I mean, it could be the motor cover. Let's, let's see if we can't find the question. It's, it's kind of weird that it says pointing up there. So see how they're not, they're not one, two, let's see, let's see, okay, there's one. Which of the following on the vertical mill? So, over the head. Yeah. Um, you gotta kind of have both of them right there with you together. Show me where the quill is on this. And it's not actually a numbered piece right there, honestly. Yeah, so here's your quill. Like that's the extends down. So that'd be your quill handle too. What is four point two called? What? I don't know if I would say that or not. I'm not really sure. Let's just see. It's not one of the questions I didn't see. The four was on there though. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't do it. So, I don't know. I'm not sure what I would really say to that part that they're looking for as the answer. I mean, I would... Is 10 pointing to like one of the locks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10's to the, the lock for the knee. Yeah. Yeah. 
okay, find me in the machinery handbook the pitch diameter for Creates sixteen two A pitch diameter. Yep, you're gonna change, you're gonna need your book. Pitch diameter on a three eight sixteen two A. Okay, I'll take that. What? Pitch diameter for a three eight sixteen two A. Did you guys find it? Did you find it? Okay, you got it. Okay. So where would I find information about indexable inserts, um, about the direction, shape, all of those things for that? Where would I find that in the handbook? If I need to know, if I'm getting ready to go buy an insertable tool, and I need to know, is it a BBMT? Is it a TNMG? Is it, um, what is it? Where am I going to find that at? 803. That is true. Yeah. So in your about 820 section, you've got a whole area on like what the tool tip looks like here. Orientation types of things. So 818, 819, 820. Am I going to find while well, I'm looking for some of these other things? Where am I going to find information on gauge block sets? Okay, show me some pages so I can see. I want to know how many. I want to know how many blocks. How many of each size blocks are in my 81 piece gauge block set? So I know I've got 81 pieces in there, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know which, how many of each thing is in there. Six ninety five. Can you tell me how many how many blocks move by one thousandth increments? What's that? It's an 81 piece block set. I think that's pretty standard. 
it, it's got a section that says in an 81 block set, doesn't it? One more question after this. That question has seven parts to it, though. What's that? I want to know in my 81 piece gauge box set, how many blocks am I going to have that move in 1,000 increments? Like 134, 135, 136, 137, or 251, whatever it might happen to be. How many blocks do I have that move in increments like that? Because your, I think your 81 block set starts at 50, then goes from 50 to 100 thousandths. Then has a section that moves in tenths, um, like 100, then one, 100 and one tenth, up to nine tenths, and then it moves to 102, or 101, and then it moves to 102, then it moves to 103. All right, where are you at? Six something? So look at 697, halfway down you see the bold, it says gauge block set, inch size, set number one, 81 blocks. First series, move in 10th increments, there's nine blocks. Second series, move in 1,000th increments, that's the question that I asked you. How many blocks are there? 49 blocks. You are almost there. So what students oftentimes think is that they're going to be able to open up the book and it's going to show them kind of a set of 81 gauge blocks, like which would be a really helpful thing to have to where they could see a pictorial view of what it is, where they could go, okay, there's these, 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 and these. You could kind of virtually stack them up to what, be what you want. It just doesn't say that like that. I don't know why. I mean, that would be great, but it doesn't. Okay, last thing. I'm going to make a keyway in a shaft. My shaft is going to be um, a one inch shaft. What is the tolerancing on my one inch shaft? I'm gonna put a square key in it. Um, I wanna know when I'm gonna make my one inch shaft, I'm gonna put a keyway in it like this. I wanna know this dimension right here. I need to know how deep I'm gonna go with my key. Well, I'm gonna find out. Anybody on the grinder today? I got some new diamond dressers. Put these back there with the stuff. Um, and then Chance, I think you need a new indicator. Is that right? Or do you have one? I got you one. Okay. I've got. I bought some of these the other day, and I only bought these because I think I could buy replacement tips for them. And 
I just want to make sure that everybody's replaced. I'm looking for a dimension. Change, got it? Oh, you look like you're back there confident. It's going. I'm going to wait till these fools find it. Um, at that point, I don't think that matters. I mean, grab, because you've got, you've got a standard anyway for a one inch shaft. Yeah, just a square. Let's just say for a one inch shaft, I think quarter inch is probably standard. Question mark. I'm trying to write, you know, down like what is it? 859. He is on page 2489. So to get that's for just a standard keyway. Now, if you go to 2499, that's a lot more in depth. So that gives you the shaft size, that gives you the key depth. Um, typically you're kind of splitting the difference there. If it's quarter inch key, then you're going quarter high and a quarter low, but you gotta leave a little bit of tolerance in there. Um, 24.99 is, is really, if you're ever gonna kind of dog ear a page, this is the page to dog ear. Um, so you can really get to kind of see those, all those dimensions, especially if you're doing both sides of it. Like you're broaching the key and milling the keyway. Okay. Tuesday, you've got your NIMS test. So um, you're welcome to just go down there. I sent, I think I sent out an announcement um, in Canvas the other day for it. So you're welcome to just head down that way at that time and then come back up here when you are done. You can come here first, answer or ask any kind of questions that you might have about it before we go. Um, and I think I even went ahead and put in, in Canvas, which test you were taking because it is not uncommon for people to get down there and go, I'm here to take my NIMS test. And they say, which one? I don't know. Even time. Yeah. And um, so be prepared. Don't come back doing the walk of shame going, hey, man, I forgot um, something, you know, and try to have the things that you need. 
After you're done there, welcome to come back. You know, you guys are nearing the tail end. If you're if you're feeling like you're going to get done ahead of time, when you're done, you're done. So, um, if you need up till the 17th, I think is what we will let you go to. Um, what did you say yesterday? The 16th. The next class to start on the 16th. Did you say that? Okay. So. Um, you know, it's right around that mid-October time that we're making the switch. So there is no gap or spring break between those things. It's just like one day you're in this class and then the next day you're in this class. So um, we'll just, everybody who's moving into, uh, we move into CNC on the second eight weeks. So uh, yeah, it'll be better over there. But um, I don't know if it'll be better, but it'll be different over there. So what if you're... If you're moving to CNC for second eight weeks at this time slot, then you are. Okay. Yeah, if you're going to a different time slot to a different class, then you're not. I only teach morning classes now, so um, it's, all, it's the only booking that I've got. So um, I will tell you this, the first week of class, second full week, of first full week of class, I think, October 24th, that week, I'm gone that week. So that is your week to be doing book work. You're welcome to go ahead and come in the shop, do things. Um, you'll have a handful of days before class, but I've, I've got to go to Virginia for a couple of days. You do whatever you want with it. Um, if, if it were me, I would use that week to, by then we'll already be in the shop. Everybody who's not a 111, already knows how to do quite a few things. We'll get you started where you need to be, and then we will, um, uh, you, you re, you're really free to come in and start working on things, but that's the week that I'm gonna use, if I were a student, to try to knock out as, much, as many class assignments as I can. That way I don't have to work them out. I mean, honestly, if you're not 111, classwork starts to get way less as you go. I mean, you can knock all that stuff out the first week and not have to worry about it anymore. That's pretty awesome. So um, that might be your route. So unfortunately, uh, I, I tried to book all of my stuff during the summer, and this one just got away from me, and I just couldn't get. The only place I could get it booked in was in Virginia on this week. So anyways. Okay. Questions? To get out there and get stuff. When does the testing center open? Do they open at 7.30 or do they open at 8? Um, that's a great question. I think they open at 8. So. I think they open at 8. Well, I think what